Um, yeah, so thanks for that nice introduction as well from Barbara and also Massimo. And a number of people have mentioned the lags um, already, which is um, one of the real developments over the last year. And just to mention Ian's point, actually, I think I consider myself lucky to be the, the person, the only person to have discovered soft lags twice in AGM because I was involved in the work on Arakin 564. And then I uh, did the discovery work on the, um, the lags in the Fabian paper, which turns out to be the paper everyone references. Um, even though the paper was about INL line, something like that, but I think everyone's forgotten about that now. Um, anyway, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, essentially the, the sort of set the scene for tomorrow as well for the round table, because with this progress that we've made in lags and understanding the origin of the lags, we'd like to then see what we can do in the future. And I think a big pointer to that, as, as uh, Barbara mentioned, is, the, is actually the discovery of the INK lags, because this is a signature that we can really sort of understand a bit better, I think, than the soft lags. And in fact, we can make huge progress with that if we build missions which have large area at the INK line. Um, and a good example of that is LOFT, and we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Okay, so, of course, the, the reason, one of the reasons we want to do this with lags is that it gives us, for the first time, absolute distances. And in fact, for the size scales that we're looking at, these are tiny, tiny regions, you know, if you try imaging them on the sky, and you're never going to be able to access those size scales with images. So the way you, you essentially make images is by doing this reverberation mapping, just like people do with AGM in the optical. And so by doing that, we get measurements of distances in kilometers, and uh, that breaks a, a lot of the degeneracies in spectral fitting, and it allows these inner regions to be mapped. And if you want to explain to someone who's not interested in strong gravity or the, the inner workings close to black holes why that's important, you just show them this, that those innermost regions energetically must be producing the enormous energetic, uh, the energetic outflows in the form of winds and powerful jets that affect structure formation in AGM. So it's really crucial, crucial both for astrophysics, but also for fundamental physics, because the, co the combination of this um, redshift information with the lags, so the spectral information with the time lags, gives us essentially dynamics, right? And that essentially allows us to test our understanding of the behavior of matter in strong gravity. So we have all of these advantages by doing these, these studies. Now, what I want to emphasize first is how important I think, especially in the future, the INK line is going to be for this work. And the reason for that is that it's really just a clean signature, and I see on its own in the spectrum. Now, uh, the, this was first discovered by Abdu Zogby in, in 2012, and actually it's interesting that a lot of this work on, on, on the lags was actually motivated by working on missions. So I got interested in working on lags and we discovered the 180707 lag on the back of work I was doing on Zeus, predicting stuff that you could do with Zeus mission. And then Abdu was involved in working on the Gravitas mission that Didier Barry, I'm sure, remembers fondly, um, uh, as I was involved with as well. And as part of that, we were looking at what you could do, and we were making predictions of what the best AGN were to look for these iron lags. And it turns out 4151 came up high in the sort of figure of merit. So Abdu went and looked at it, and he found the iron K alpha lag. So we, we pretty much know where to look for these. Now, the key thing about this is you see the core of the line at longer time scales, so low frequencies. The core of the line shows up in the lags, and it has larger lags. So that's what you expect if it's coming from larger scales. The wings of the lines have smaller lags, so it all fits into the picture. And in fact, I think this is really important, this, this discovery of the iron lags. And in a way, it's more, I think it's more important than the soft lags, although the soft lags prompted the search for the iron lags. And the reason it's important is because it's really the smoking gun signature of disk reflection, that it's the signature saying that the size scales that we're looking at when we see the INK alpha line are small. That it's essentially the, the independent confirmation of the inner disk origin of the INK lines, at least in, in the sources where you detect this. Right? And that's really important because um, that's the first, I think, in, in independent evidence supporting this interpretation since the INK lines, the broad INK lines were discovered. And obviously, it's been a controversial topic even since then. Now, it's not the only case, 4151. Since then, a whole bunch of other observations have been uh, performed, and people have looked at the, the, the observations to find these lags. Erin Kara, uh, in particular, is uh, uh, one of Andy Fabian's PhD students at Cambridge. She's done a fantastic work on this, um, and Abdi Zogby also. Um, and yeah, they, they show it. When, you when you've got good enough data, good enough signal for noise, you always see these features around about the, the energy of the, of the iron K line. So they seem to be fairly ubiquitous. 
And what I would argue is that these are really clean signatures because, as we've heard a number of times before, and Chris has also in particular mentioned this, that when you see that, look at the soft lags, you see these different behaviours. So although the soft lags in general, they scale with the, the size scale, scale with the black hole mass, as you'd expect, there's probably different processes contributing to this. So you have photoionised reflection, dispermal emission, Comptonization producing lags as well. And all these different components lead to essentially different shapes for the soft lags, where you always see, when you overplot them, you just, re just scale by the lag, you, you always see this feature at the INK line. But the soft lags are all doing different things. And I think that's very interesting. It really shows you that, that the, the INK lag is a sort of consistent feature. And that's probably because that's just reverberation, and here you've got more complexity. Now, one possible explanation for this is just the reflection spectra themselves are much more complicated in the soft band. So, you know, the classic, this is a, one of the classic examples from Boston Fabian 2005, where when you look at, you know, mostly the typical ionization states that we expect to see, if you look down at low energies, that soft lag is essentially being contributed by a whole bunch of lines. So it's very dependent on the ionization state, the, you know, essentially the ionization structure of the disk, whereas the I and K line is much cleaner, it's there on its own. And so if you then now imagine, this is just, uh, this is high resolution. So if you now imagine smearing this by the relativistic effects, all these are going to be smeared together, whereas the INK line, again, is going to still remain fairly clean. Okay, so even high resolution won't really solve this problem, um, uh, because everything's going to be smeared together anyway. You don't need really high resolution to look at broad relativistic features. Um, so once we have this feature, we can, because it's a clean signature, we can actually start to do modelling of this, this IMK line. And so Ed Cackett, this paper has just recently appeared on Astro PH. And what he's been doing is, is essentially doing the relativistic ray tracing of the line. And uh, you can essentially predict the response of the line as a function of time, time lag across here, and energy. And then, so if you just collapse that on the energy axis, you'll see that it's just the, the uh, familiar spectrum of the INK alpha line uh, relativistically broadened. And then if you look collapse it on the time axis, you see there's this sort of characteristic transfer function. And what you can do then is fit this to the to the ion line. You can predict the response to lag as a function of energy. And you can start to fit these models, essentially just starting with simple lamppost models, but with full GR ray tracing, to actually see if you can actually explain the lags. And it seems to work pretty well. I mean the data isn't isn't fantastic still. I mean, it's great that we can detect these at all, I think, these iron line lags. But it actually gives consistent results with, which sort of seem to make sense. There doesn't seem to be anything pathological about these, these uh, fits, essentially. That you've got a seven gravitational radii source height. Reflective fraction is about one. It gives the right sort of covering fraction, which is really good. And it all works nicely with the, the known uh, mass from reverberation mapping. So if you just assume this, you can actually fit these, these things pretty well, the frequency dependence of the lags and the energy dependence. Um, the spin's unconstrained, that's just because we don't have much signal to noise in the red wing of the line. So it all works very nicely. Now, the next part I'd like to say, just also to set the scene for tomorrow, is that INK alpha is going to be really important to doing this reverberation studies because it's a clean signal. But the other thing is that X-ray binaries are really going to take over as the best objects to do reverberation mapping of specifically of strong field gravity and accretion of strong field gravity. Now, AGN will be, always be useful in their own right and very interesting in their own right because they're very distinct objects that obviously have a big role you know, affecting you know, growth of structure in the universe and so on. So as AGN, they will be always interesting to study. But if you want to study strong field gravity and the behavior of matter in strong field gravity, I think X-ray binaries are going to be the place to do that. Um, of course, they're, always, they're also interesting astrophysically, and we see all these different phenomena, different states and things, and we'd like to map the changes in structure of the innermost regions when you see these changes in states when the jet switches on and off and you have perhaps changes in the trication radius, radius of the disk and all these, these phenomena. You'll, they potentially do, as we've heard, lead to also predictions about how AGM should behave. So if we can understand these changes in structure and actually map uh, X-ray binaries as they go through state changes, we could also learn a lot about AGM. And again, bear in mind, these are sub nano arc second scales in X-ray binaries, so there's no, no way that you're ever going to image that using conventional techniques. So what do we know about the binaries? Well, this is one of my sort of movies that I like to show, which is just that it shows you that how the lags change as a function of frequency or time scale. So what happens is, when you look at the low, uh, at low frequencies, and you measure lag versus energy, you see this dip, and the dip comes in 
essentially where the disk comes in. So what this is showing you is that the power law photons here are lagging behind the disk photons here. So the idea of, behind that is its propagation effects. The variations start out in the disk, and they propagate through, and then reach the power law emitting region, and you have a lag. But the interesting thing is when you go up to higher frequencies, and what, what you get there is you see that this, essentially, you, uh, you switch over the lag, and the lag just flips around, and that's consistent with a switch from uh, propagation effects to reverberation, to thermal, re thermal reverberation, essentially, as, as Barbara mentioned it in her, in her talk. So we know then that there are, there looks very strong evidence that there are thermal reverberation lags. We're seeing reverberation signatures in the X-ray binaries. And this is in the hard state, where we have a nice lot of energy in the power law, a lot of luminosity illuminating the disk. And so that's essentially heating the disk, and you get this, this thermal reverberation signature. But you see that at high frequencies. And it's a very similar picture to what we see in AGM. Propagation effects perhaps at lower frequencies, and then a switch in the lag corresponding to the change over to reverberation. So it's a very consistent picture. <coughs> what about the iron line? Well, you know, that's the, I think uh, Didier mentioned it this morning, that you look at 6.4 keV, and there's a hint of something there, but I wouldn't put a lot of money on it. I mean, it, what's interesting is, it, is the best, the best data we had was uh, GX339. Actually, Cygnus X1, because it's brighter, and this is going to be an important point coming up, it, it, it has almost as good signal to noise in 16 kiloseconds as G339 has 140 kiloseconds. And interestingly, although the, again the soft lags are different, you see that that's another theme emerging. But look here, maybe it's the same sort of shape. And in fact, what, what we're hoping to do, the problem is this is all in the hard state. And Cygnus X1 is the ideal source to study this. What you'd really like to do is study this uh, with a much longer observation. At the moment, we're getting something like half a millisecond, that's 10 RG light travel time, basically, uh, with, with, around the iron line. But what we're hoping to do is go to much smaller sizes. And in fact, the current the equivalent in 4151 is 2 to 3 RG. So at the moment, the X-ray binaries are, the best case is about a factor of four worse than in the AGM. So how do we improve that? Well, we look at the brightest object. We, look at, we want to look at Cygnus X1. This is a simulation of what we could do with a weak observation with XMM Newton and New Star. And uh, essentially, you do this fantastically, you'd be able to get the reflection and so on. Um, the problem is, is that this needs it to be in a hard state. And Cygnus X1, since this uh, original week long XMM observation was approved, it's uh, resolutely stayed in a soft state, unprecedentedly long soft state. It's just really annoying. <laughs> so hopefully, if, if the source of, um, you know, behaves itself and goes back into a hard state, we'll get something like this in the near future. Hopefully. Um, now, one question is, why is it that X-ray binaries are currently a lot worse than, than AGM for the lag measurements? And um, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward, really. If you look at the light curves, this is the old favorite that Ian showed, actually, NGC uh, 5506 with Exosat, and it's still a great light curve, because you can just see this nice continuous light curve. But it illustrates the point. If you look, this is now the same time scale. So if you just say, just pick a random you know, characteristic time scale. So this is 10,000 light crossing times of the innermost uh, of, of the 1RG. And you look at, you can really see variability in detail there. The same region in, in an X-ray binary, you can hardly see anything. So it's photons per time scale, right? You have many more photons per characteristic time scale in an AGM, in an X-ray binary. And that means that in a characteristic time, you have something like a signal to noise are like this. You basically take your number of the, the count rate multiplied by the characteristic time and take the square root, and that's your signal to noise. So it's just how many photons have you got in that characteristic time. The thing is, though, if you have a long observation, you also scale that with the number of cycles. How many actual time scales have you counted in your observation? And of course, for X-ray binaries, that's huge, right, because the time scales are really short. So in the end, there's another effect where essentially that characteristic time scale thing sort of cancels out, and it just depends on the count rate and the observing time, and that affects your signal to noise for a single light curve. Now this is just for one light curve, so this is for, be for measuring timing signatures, for example, in one light curve. When you measure a lag, what you're doing is multiplying two light curves together. And what that means, to cut a long story short, is that you essentially have an extra cross term, right, when you multiply the noise. And that depends on when you have your other band, your reference band that you're correlating everything with, if you've just got a, a very few photons per time scale in that, so S and 1, that cross term dominates the signal to noise. And that's true for X-ray binaries. So X-ray binaries have this extra term in the error, basically, that scales linearly with count rate. 
So it, it makes the errors, it makes it noisy in the data, but it very quickly goes away. As you increase the area, you increase the count rate, because the signal to noise scales linearly with the rate in X-ray binaries. And, and, and so we're just on the edge, really, of X-ray binaries overtaking AGM. And so this is this characteristic sort of figure of merit to show this. If you look at the signal to noise, this is essentially the, um, uh, that's one RG. So if you can measure a lag of one gravitational radius light crossing time, that's, that's where you are. And we're about at the moment here. So we can measure maybe sort of between 0.1 and 1 RG with AGN and with X-ray binaries in typical flux ranges. But because of this, this sort of dependence on X-ray binaries, ultimately what counts is just the count rate. And X-ray binaries get there, they're much, much brighter than AGM. And so once you go up above a square meter, X-ray binaries, you have much better signal for noise for reverberation studies for the same exposure time. And that's what we hope to do, essentially, with loft. If you go up to 10 square meters, it's just crazy. You just have this really, really good signal for noise data. Um, if you look at AGN, loft is, a, is, is certainly great for AGN as well. Even though it has background, the increase in area just outweighs that. So the I and K line, which is where loft has, loft has all its area, so Athena Plus will do much better in the soft band. But the I and K line, which I think is very crucial because it's clean, you'll get this great uh, detection of the lags compared to Athena Plus. So that's important to bear in mind. That's why we really need loft, I think, to, to tackle the problem of the reverberation before we have the more difficult problem of, of these soft, soft lags, which will be measured really well with Athena Plus. X-ray binary is, well, you know, it's just insanely good for data. The lag versus energy is just, you can hardly see those error bars down here. So you'll get amazing measurements and really easily be able to tell the difference between different structures, different radii. One final thing I'd like to finish on, if you really have the signal to noise, you can do really good stuff, for example, doing Doppler tomography. So if you have a QPO, now this is just an assumption, this is a straw man model, just to say how well can you accurate, how accurately can you measure um, these sorts of spectral timing parameters. So if you have a 2% QPO, 2% RMS, and that QPO is just produced by a hotspot just going around, so you put in all the GR effects and so on, and those hotspots just randomly appear and go away, and that produces this quasi-periodic oscillation. So, I mean, this is, a, I know there are different models for the high-frequency QPOs. This is just to demonstrate the power of having this high, high large collecting area. If you put in those effects, you get light curves like this, and this is without the noise added. But when you add the noise and you do, do some little tricks with, with the spectral timing, you can pull out a signature like this. And what this is is energy here, which is the plot of that, energy and time. And this is just phase, essentially. So it's like a phase folded light um, signal of the, the iron line, essentially. The shift in the iron line is this hot spot's going around just due to the relativistic effect. And uh, you essentially can, can measure a spectrum. So you essentially do phase resolve spectra of this. Really amazing. Remember, this is a 2% signal, right, on top of a, essentially 10% signal, which is the iron line. It's, it's, and, and you can pick out these big changes as the iron line. So you can essentially do phase, do, look at the, the sort of effects of the, um, um, on the waveform, essentially due to general relativity. So these aren't nice sinusoids. These are actually a bit triangular because of the GR effects. So that's essentially what you could do in the future with this, with LOF. Um, and I'll just leave my conclusions here. Thank you.